Chair, you're muted. I can't hear you. Good evening and welcome to Easley Borough Council's Cabinet meeting of the 25th of June. This evening's meeting is being broadcast on Microsoft Teams Live. And during the course of this evening's meeting, uh, we'll be hearing a range of debate on issues such as the Borough Council's local plan, Council's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and an update on the Council's climate change action plan. During the course of this evening's meeting, we'll have contributions from uh, members of the Council's Cabinet and a number of guests this evening. My name is Keith House, I'm Chair of the Cabinet and also Leader of the Council. Cabinet members will be participating during the course of the meeting. They're pictured on our screen now. This evening we have apologies from Councillor Paul Bicknell and Councillor Rupert Curl will be joining us in a few, min few minutes time. Uh, he's arriving a little bit late from work this evening. A number of members of staff will participate in the, in the course of the meeting, uh, depending upon uh, the, the issues to be discussed, and we'll bring them in uh, if we need to during the course of the discussion. So, uh, we always start our meetings with public participation, uh, and there is no public participation uh, this evening, uh, but that's not to say we haven't got a fair number of guests. We have. Uh, we have a range of councillors from the Borough Council, from the County Council, and also contributions from our parish councillors too. And a member of the public has written in with a statement that we'll get to uh, later when we reach our climate change uh, paper. So let's look, start by looking at the agenda. We have the minutes of our meeting on the 21st of May up first. And I'll just ask if there's a member who would like to wave at me. I can see on my screen, members of the public will be able to see on their screen who are happy to adopt those minutes. That's, thank you, Derek Pretty. If there's a seconder, Councillor Ian Corbyn. But any issues on any of the minutes that anyone wishes to raise? No? OK, in which case we'll take that uh, as agreed. Moving on to apologies for this evening's meeting. We've already noted from Councillor uh, Paul Bicknell. Councillor Kerr will be joining us uh, shortly. At this point in the meeting, I have to ask if any members of the Cabinet have any declarations of interest they wish to make on items of council business. This is, these are issues where they may be precluded either from voting or maybe simply they live close to someone that's involved in one of the papers and want to put that on record for transparency. And we welcome Councillor Rupert Curl to the meeting as well. Are there any declarations of interest at this stage? No, nope, I'm seeing lots of people shaking their heads, uh, so I'll take that as a no. Thank you very much, colleagues. So moving on to the first substantive business item, and I'm going to change the order of the items here uh, because most people want to take part in the local plan item. So we're going to move straight to the local plan item first. And I'm going to group the discussion hopefully in a way uh, which means that we can cover different topics in a sensible order without jumping about all over the place. I'm going to ask in a moment Councillor Alex Bourne uh, to speak about the Chicken Lane Link Road. We will then have any discussion that's necessary on, on that item. We'll then move on to a discussion about local gaps and development issues on Hamlet Peninsula. I'll be asking Councillor Steve Holmes to join us at that point. Also, we'll be hearing a written presentation uh, that will be read by Laura Johnson, by Council staff from Hamble Parish Council. Uh, when we've concluded discussion on those items, we'll then move on to a discussion on the growth option. Uh, where we have a range of speakers, uh, Councillor Anwen Stanley from Bishop's Oak Parish Council, Councillor Mike Thornton from Hampshire County Council, uh, from our own council, Councillors Nick Cauldry and Jim Tidridge. We'll then have a discussion on anything to do with the strategic growth option and we'll then move on to general discussion on the local plan and I'll ask Councillor Margaret Atkinson uh, to, uh, uh, to join the debate at that point. So that's the introduction to the item. The local plan is a pretty critical document for, the, for a local authority. It sets out development choices for the coming decades. Uh, in our case, the council published the local plan and sent it to the planning inspectorate uh, to review uh, through hearings. And the council's intention was to have a local plan that ran through to 2036. The inspector, after quite some delay, wrote back to the council on uh, the beginning of April uh, this year, uh, and she wrote a long letter uh, setting out a range of issues which she wanted to give more thought to. Uh, specifically, she wanted the council to give further consideration to and justify its publishing 
uh, a statement of intent that it wished to proceed eventually uh, with the chicken or link road subject to finance becoming available. Also, she asked for details uh, and a great explanation and clarity on local gap policy. And she also recommended the council delete the strategic growth option. Uh, and on the basis of the council's performance on delivering a large number of homes over the course of the last year, she suggested last years, she suggested that the local plan uh, could go ahead without that option, uh, but for a shorter period through to 2030. But the council should commit to a review of the local plan uh, not so long after the plan gets adopted. We're still some way off the plan getting adopted. Uh, we have to respond to the inspector. Uh, we have to agree modifications to the plan with the inspector. We then have to consult with those to consult the public with those published through cabinet and council. And we can then after a lot after another period uh, of the inspector's consideration move towards adopting the plan at some point during 2021. So that's the, the, the summary. Uh, a very short summary of a very long process. Uh, a number of members have wanted to speak on the paper this evening, and I'm now going to ask uh, Councillor Alex Bourne to raise the first issue, issue which is around the Chicken Oil Lane Link Road. Good evening, Alex, and welcome to the Cabinet. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'd like to speak. Uh, uh, Alex, in you're muted. Oh. oh, it shows as unmuted. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Bourne, you're now muted. Good old Surface Pro. Can you start from the beginning, Alex? Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'd like to speak tonight in favour of keeping um, the Chicken or Link Road in the local plan. Um, as an Eastley resident and an ELAC councillor, um, one of our main focuses in ELAC is air quality and one of the main things that can alleviate that would be the chicken chicken or lane link road. Um, the only thing I've ever agreed with our previous MP on was that she said that the link road was important and that she would get it to us within her first 100 days. Now, I'm very sad that she failed on that. Um, so I'd like us to keep going forward with that. Um, to make sure that it happens. Now, we know the expense is, is astronomical and we need government help and county council help, but it's one of the main causes of um, pollution, air quality, poor air quality on Southampton Road, which um, is a major um, road in, in our area that has high um, poor air quality. Um, also, the congestion that comes from Bishop Stoke um, not only affects the air quality, but also affects um, the uh, the traffic congestion etc so um keeping this in the plan i think is absolutely essential for um eastleigh as well as the borough in tackling con traffic congestion and traffic and tackling air quality thank you chair thank you very much alex that's uh, very helpful uh, some confusion has been thrown into the issue of the chicken oil link road the council uh, as a matter of policy um, published some supporting text in the local plan uh, around support for the Chickalolay Link Road, but did not include a specific policy with a timetable attached to it because the council can't by itself deliver the policy. Uh, Hampshire County Council is the highway authority for our area and the proposal is a very expensive one and uh, requires the cooperation of a significant number of landowners. Uh, we got very close in some ways to delivering the Chicken Oil Link Road about a decade or so ago, a bit more than that now, uh, just before the last financial crash, uh, when circ circumstances were just beginning to come together, which suggested it might be possible to deliver the Chicken Oil Link Road. Uh, the lack of public finance, as well as e wider economic conditions, has made the Chicken Oil Link Road much harder to deliver in the intervening period, uh, but a long-standing commitment from this council, which goes back many years now, uh, to deliver a re relief road for Eastleigh is still very much uh, part of our objective. And the, the inspector has uh, asked for more details to justify the policy. Uh, I'm very sure uh, that all members of the council are absolutely committed to wanting to secure that link road uh, in due course, albeit we can't say what in due course is uh, at the moment. So thank you, Alex, for, for that. I hope I've given uh, a reassurance to those that are concerned about the link road uh, that we very much are committed to delivering it, albeit, as you say, uh, that the previous MP uh, claimed that it was going to be funded uh, within 100 days uh, with the support of George Osborne, who was then uh, about to become 
uh, the Chancellor uh, in a Conservative government. So thank you for that. Uh, was there anyone else wanting to speak on the chicken or lane link road? Derek Pretty, I think, wants to come in now. So Derek, we'll ask you to make your contribution. And then a Rupert Curl will go straight to after after Derek. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think uh, I totally agree with uh, Councillor Vaughan. Um, I do know that there are discussions taking place with between Diageo's, Aitchison's, and the airport uh, to try and open up the uh, inside area and the northeast corner of the airport. Uh, I believe they've been in touch with the Solent Lab, and they're keen to work with us. I'm sure that there is no more um, impetus on the part of all parties to try and achieve this. So I think uh, if we continue to uh, make our efforts and make our representations, we may well achieve it at some point. But uh, it is important to achieve our employment um, goals as well. We, without Riverside and North East Airport, we would be rather short. So we need to make every effort. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Derek. Uh, Rupert, you wanted to come in on this one. Yes, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to add the fact that actually, uh, notwithstanding the comments of the inspector, um, but I absolutely agree with everything that's just been said actually by, by both previous speakers. But if it is, isn't in a legally adopted document, I think actually given that it will be a multi-agency approach given also government money but also the county council if it's not actually in a legally adopted document i would think it would probably be incredibly difficult for those agencies to be able to prioritize funds to actually be able to deliver that piece of uh, vital uh, uh, infrastructure which we have uh, has been a priority for the borough council for decades as you have quite rightly pointed out chair but yes yeah, so if it isn't in the in the plan for that period of time i would think as we've seen possibly in the far past that it will never get up to the top top list, if you like, of top three or top four um, pieces of infrastructure that will need to be delivered within that term of the plan. And therefore, you would then be looking decades before we would potentially be able to see any sort of level of funding from government or county or anywhere else that would then be able to deliver this vital piece of infrastructure that Eastleigh clearly is needed for a long time and clearly does definitely need now. Thank you, Chair. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you very much, Rupert. That's uh, much appreciated and I absolutely agree with those points uh, and also uh, Derek's contribution too, uh, as well as Alex for introducing the item. We clearly do want to send out exactly the right signals uh, about the link road. That does mean we need to reference it in the local plan, albeit we can't have a formal policy because we can't guarantee to deliver it by 2030. Um, but the statement of intent is really important and I'm glad that it's one that clearly there is very strong support across the council for. I can't see anyone else wishing to speak on that section of the local plan. Uh, so I'm next going to go to Councillor Steve Holes, a councillor from uh, Burslandon and Hound North, uh, who wants to speak on some Hamble related issues. And I'll ask uh, Laura Johnson to stand by uh, to read a contribution from Hamble Parish Council when Steve finishes. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Chair. Um, I may also have a follow up if I may at the appropriate time. That's fine. Um, can the chairman confirm that the following the inspector's comments on the plan, the res residents of Bursledon, Hamble and Hound can be assured that the protection of the strategic gap and countryside on the Hamble Peninsula currently afforded will be continued for the life of the plan and that due to lack of infrastructure, traffic pressure and the importance of maintaining a strategic gap between Southampton and the three settlements, Provision for further significant development on the Hamble Peninsula will not be included in the plan going forward. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, the simple answer is absolutely yes, uh, I can give that assurance. Um, the strategic gaps around the borough, uh, not least on the Hamble Peninsula, are very, very important to the council, and it's absolutely uh, vital that they are retained. And we know that local gaps uh, remain important to local residents in each of our towns and villages. Uh, that are each very distinct places. So however the review required by the inspector progresses, uh, we must ensure that local gaps are protected. The case against additional new development on the Hamble Peninsula uh, has finally won support, as we know, from Hampshire County Council as the Highway Authority for the transport reasons that, again, we all know about. So, so nothing has changed uh, with any of those issues. We will review the local gaps as we've been asked to do and create and provide justification for them. 
Um, but beyond that, yes, of course, they must be retained. They're very important to our community. Now, Steve, you said you wanted a, a supplementary, so we'll come to, to that now. Thank you, Chairman, if I may. Given your encouraging an answer, can you confirm how this policy affects the development south of Satchel Lane, approved on appeal in 2018 against council policy? Thank you, Steve, uh, for that. Yes, the, the Satchel Lane planning application was one where uh, the parish council and a number of uh, a number of colleagues, and, and including myself, uh, spoke at an appeal. Um, the local authority, the local area committee, had refused planning permission for development on a critical countryside site immediately adjacent to uh, the old Hamble airfield. Uh, and regrettably, the government planning inspector, uh, for some quite odd reasons, uh, decided to approve the development, even though the council already had a demonstrable uh, five year land supply and the location was very badly accessed in terms of pedestrian routes uh, through to Hamble village and, and up to, to Hamble school. Uh, interestingly, the inspector with the permission uh, decided to uh, put some conditions on the application requiring the applicant to come forward with final details within 12 months. Uh, those That 12 month period elapsed uh, in December of last year, uh, which means that technically uh, that planning commission can't now be implemented. Now, the way that I read that and the way that our, our legal advisors read that means that any applicant would have to go back to square one on those issues now. Uh, and that would mean providing a brand new application um, rather than uh, rather than relying on the permission that was granted. And I would hope the local area committee would then have the confidence to to look at that on that basis, which is that this would be an application in the countryside without policy support uh, and will put the council in a reasonably good position uh, to have a cracking chance at refusing uh, any uh, further development in that area. Thank you, Steve, for, for, for that. I hope that's covered the points that you uh, raised. Uh, I'm now going to ask Laura Johnson to read a contribution from Hamble Parish Council. Laura. Having followed the progress of the local plan, the inspector's comments and now EBC's response, Hamble Parish Council is concerned about the implications for assessing sites, those mentioned in West End, Burswood and Hamble, the potential change to the settlement gaps policy and, policy, and also policy HA2, Mercury Marina proposals. All of these could have a significant impact on the community in Hamble. In the light of this, can you please come and discuss the proposed changes as they affect us before responding publicly to the inspector and consulting on modifications? And this is from the planning committee on behalf of Hamble Parish Council. All right, well, thank you, Hamble Parish Council Planning Committee. It's good to have your contribution this evening. And I think those are perfectly fair and reasonable comments and questions. Uh, so, yes, we will. Uh, make sure we have a discussion with not just you, but also with other parishes uh, around the borough about the implications of the local plan, in particular those areas where the inspector has asked for uh, more information to be provided and indeed reviews. So uh, we will be consulting with parish councils before we get to a point where we agree modifications through cabinet or council. So uh, we can give that reassurance. Thank you, Hamble Parish Council uh, for that. Now then, I think that probably covers that, unless anyone else has any contribution they want to make on local gaps around the borough. I'm or... really sorry, Keith, to interrupt and just to pass on Councillor Aries surface has a major recovery issue, which Paul is unable to, to uh, solve over the phone. He needs the surface to do that. So unfortunately, David has now got to pass on his apologies. OK, we regret to have not have uh, David Aries with us for the rest of this meeting, unless we see miraculous recovery with uh, David's IT. Um, so where did I got to? Yes, I was asking colleagues if anyone else wanted to contribute either on Hamble Peninsula issues or on local gaps around the borough. I can't see any indication of anyone wanting to speak. So in which case uh, we'll start on what I suspect is the uh, major item uh, for discussion this evening with regard to the local plan, uh, which is the strategic growth option. And I'm very pleased to invite former Deputy Leader of Eastleigh Borough Council uh, and a uh, long time uh, Bishopstoke Parish Councillor, indeed I think founding member of Bishopstoke Parish Council uh, quite a number of years ago, Anne Wynne Stanley to speak and ask a question, I believe. Anne. Thank you. Good evening, Cabinet. Um, what I'd like to say, I note that in her letter, the Government Inspector requests further investigations of the different options for major development which would be north of Bishopstoke and around Fair Oak, or between Bishopstoke and West End, 
or on the Hamble Peninsula before any, option, any of those options are included in any future local plan for the period after 2030. But the letter did say a local plan covering the first part of the intended local plan period without an SGO would be acceptable as the council was delivering more homes than had been anticipated, provided that the additional work she considered necessary was then carried out in an early review of the local plan. This causes me to have concerns about potential speculative planning applications for sites in the SGO area during the shortened local plan period while the requested review is carried out. We saw plenty of such speculative applications over recent years in the Hamble Peninsula and North of Hedge End areas. Such speculative applications always carry the risk of lack of contributions towards infrastructure. The one redeeming feature of the SGO was the infrastructure that would come with it and the ability to require much of the infrastructure to be provided ahead of the development. Indeed, it was one of the conditions on development that sufficient of the link road was provided ahead of any construction work starting. The current roads to the north of Bishop, towards the north of Bishopstoke site could not take the construction traffic. So I ask for a commitment that the council will not support any new housing in the countryside in this area during the 10 year life of the new local plan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Anne. That's a whole stack of issues there that are really important for us to, to get to grips with. Um, we've been really, really clear on this issue. Anywhere that the council is not allocating uh, for development in the local plan, once it's adopted, and certainly effectively from now, uh, where a developer puts forward a speculative application on greenfield sites that are in the countryside, the council's position has to be a robust no. Now, unless any of those arise out of modest local gap changes, and I wouldn't have thought there'd be any of those in the Bishop's Oak and Fair Oak area, uh, unless any of those circumstances arise, that puts the council in a position where we can be really clear, uh, we will seek to defeat any application for development that comes forward speculatively on greenfield sites in the strategic growth option area at any point during the local plans adopted period, which runs through uh, to 2030. So that's an important point to make. I thank you, Anne, for, for raising it this evening. And of course, it does apply to other locations around the borough, uh, particularly those that are sensitive uh, or with gaps attached to them. Uh, and the council will, as it has done mostly successfully, over the course of the last decade, uh, seek to rebut and forcefully rebut uh, speculative applications for development in those areas. So the greenfield gaps around Bishop's Oak and Fair Oak uh, that were shown as being in the growth option area effectively as of now are not there. Um, the growth option has been deleted. And did you have a supplementary or not at that point? I'm not getting I'm not getting a waving hand there. No, thank you. That's fine. Thank you very much for your response, Chair. OK, thank you very much, Anne. Um, right, so we can now go to uh, Councillor Mike Thornton, uh, who I believe has a, a question related to the local plan and the strategic growth option. Mike, good evening Hi. from uh, the Sahara Desert by the look of it. No, oh, yes, well, I just thought I'd put up something that is shows that it is warmer somewhere else in the world than here. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it's true today. Um, I, just uh, as I go into this question, because they're all so related, one of the things I would just like to mention about Anne's point and your point is that whenever I talked about the local plan, I always said, if there's no relief road, the houses can't be built there. And I think that that is quite evident that that is important to stick to that. Um, Talking about Alex's question about the CLR, the, 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 the problem I see with that is that, just this is changing slightly what I was going to say, is that we all would want it then, we'll all push it as hard as we can, but I don't see it coming in in the next 10 or 15 years, to be honest, not in the state of the finances the County Council and the government has. 
So what I'm really worried about is the fact that we're going to see more and more traffic congestion on Bishopstoke Road. Um, and it's not only frustrating for motorists, but it's bad for the environment and the health of cyclists and pedestrians who are able to commute using more eco-friendly methods. So what can we do to increase the use of such eco-friendly methods and public transport while the county council has cut subsidies to public transport over the years and which leaves little alternative but the car for those who go you know travel a long distance what improvements in infrastructure can this council can easily borough council be able to achieve to alleviate the problem for our health and our sanity and Anyone who knows lives in Bishopstoke, that road into Bishopstoke from Fair Oak and Horton Heath and Botley, etc., is an absolute nightmare normally during rush hour. So, what what can we do, Keith? I, I, I think it's a very difficult thing for you to answer, but I would like to know what you think we can do. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, well, of course, you've you've now you've now delivered the impossible question, um, which uh, I, I guess would be right coming from a Hampshire County Councillor uh, visiting Eastley Borough Council's meeting, uh, which is that um, Eastley Borough Council is not the highway authority for for most road issues, uh, and therefore our ability by ourselves is very very limited. Uh, we do rely on Hampshire County Council to deliver road schemes, in particular major road schemes, and the only solution that was in the local plan as published and went that went to inspection uh, that gave any hint of making traffic conditions better was the northern relief route now clearly the northern relief route has disappeared along with the strategic growth option the local plan as published and the evidence from the transport analysis that was carried out in great detail uh, both by hampshire county council and by eastley borough council suggested that without the strategic growth option and the new road corridor traffic conditions will be worse than they are today and worse than they would be if the growth option was included. So the position at the moment is that we would expect conditions on Bishopstoke Road and the Eastern Corridor into Eastley to, to worsen over the course of the next decade. And we need to also understand that the majority of the reason for that is not development in Eastley Borough, it's development outside of Eastley Borough. It's traffic that wants to get from elsewhere, uh, from Winchester City District and from Fareham Borough, uh, through our roads to get to the motorways uh, and the M3 in particular and to an extent the M27, although some of that traffic goes south to Junction 7. So the Borough Council's ability to intervene is, is pretty limited, uh, really. Uh, we, what we can do uh, is a number of things. Firstly, uh, we can make some modest contributions ourselves from our own funds. Uh, you will be aware, and Anne Stanley will be aware because she was part of the project that, that promoted it, uh, that we have allocated a million pounds, uh, mainly to junction improvements and capacity improvements along that corridor, uh, which is mainly about getting the roundabouts working better and traffic lights working better, because those are the areas where you can make the, the first quick wins. But in the long term, uh, we really are reliant on Hampshire County Council uh, coming up with uh, a package of proposals uh, that can work to alleviate, tra alleviate traffic. And as you say, Mike, the country is going to be broke uh, as a result of the issues of the last uh, three months. So. There is no simple solution on offer, unfortunately. Uh, we will do what we can do. Uh, Mike, have you got any supplementary that you want to ask on that? Uh, no, I wish I had a supplementary that could suggest a reasonable solution, but um, I haven't. And I think it's a sad state of affairs that this is going to happen now. But, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, uh, Mike, for that. Right now, I've got Nick Cauldry next. Rupert Curl has indicated that he wants to speak, but I'm going to take Jim Tidridge before I get to, to Rupert on the basis that I'm, I'm assuming that it's all, all around the same theme around the SGO. So Nick Cauldry is going to come next. After we've heard from Nick, we'll go to Jim Tidridge and then Rupert will be first in the queue from the Cabinet to contribute. Nick, welcome. And uh, Nick, you're muted at the moment. Or else you're very quiet. No, I'm not very quiet. I'm just muted. That's better. Thank you. So there we are. Um, before I uh, ask uh, a couple of questions, I'd like to just uh, point out this first time I've spoken publicly about the strategic oath option. And previously I was barred from doing so because I had 
land in the area and had an interest. Thanks to the inspector, I no longer have an interest and I can speak about this very important uh, proposal for the uh, um, for, for the people in, in my ward. Um, the strategic, uh, I, I was very glad to hear your absolute um, commitment that there will be no building on the, of houses on the land that was des was proposed to be designated as part of the strategic growth option. The fact is we've got to comply with that sort of thing. I'm glad to see that in the case of the Mortimer's Farm application, this has been implemented already by um, by by the staff and um, a, what a perfectly good proposal for for uh, expansion of housing in that uh, farm was rejected because it was not in, 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 in the appropriate area. Um, so I, I assume that that commitment covers all of the uh, land in Fair Oak. More importantly, perhaps, is the road. Traffic is bad going into Eastleigh, but it's very bad all the way along. And it means that people in the rush hour getting, trying to get from Fair Oak to Eastleigh would do better uh, walking by and large. So in fact, they've got to go on afterwards uh, means they've got to have that car. But the fact it's, it's it's intolerable and it's going. And if we don't build another house in this. Uh, in, in, in the ward or in, in the borough, it's going to get worse and worse. That's what the traffic studies revealed. And that's why I was so concerned about um, the, the, uh, the, the I am concerned about what we need to do about it. The um, in particular, we know that the Horton Heath development with the one Horton Heath, which is a, a, a very good development, it's a necessary development and has my entire support, but it is going to produce an awful lot of traffic that's going to come up Allington Lane and either try to go north or, or go um, into Eastleigh. And Eastleigh Road and Fair Oak Road can't cope. What can we do about it? That's a question. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Nick. Um, well, firstly, I'm, I'm, it's good to, to make again the points that I raised in response to uh, to Anne and, and Mike really which and they very much apply to Fair Oak as, as much as they do to to Bishopstoke which is that removing the growth option means the council uh, will give full countryside protection to all the green fields uh, land in the form of growth option uh, and will be absolutely resolute on this and we will need support from Hampshire County Council on traffic uh, as this is projected, projected to get worse uh, without the new link road uh, and the growth option. Uh, there are other things we can do uh, one thing that comes from the one Horton Heath package, which I'm glad you gave your support to there, Nick, is that uh, we would expect to deliver a, a cycle link uh, from Horton Heath, not quite in parallel with the railway line, but sort of linked to being close to the railway line uh, so that it's possible to cycle uh, from Horton Heath to Eastleigh uh, quicker than it's possible to get in the car and drive uh, from Horton Heath to Eastleigh. And those sort of changes can make a material difference. I probably should have answered Mike Thornton with uh, with, with that point because it was it was relevant to his issue about cycling um, and those things can can make a difference clearly in the short term the best that we can do as a local planning authority but not a local highway authority uh, is work with Hampshire on road junctions as we've just been discussing and we do know that a lot of congestion along that corridor coming in from Fairwick and Bishopstoke simply relates to the bottleneck uh, once you get to the approach of the railway bridge and then the gyratory system uh, between the railway bridge and Eastleigh Town Centre. If we could tackle that series of road changes by making it by making a package that was capable of flowing properly, it would make a massive, massive difference uh, to congestion on that road corridor. We know too uh, that if we could improve the size of the Chicken or Lane roundabout, that too would have uh, not such a dramatic effect, but it would have a significant effect at relieving congestion because it's about the flows. It would also improve the flows of traffic leaving the industrial estate at the peak time in the, in the late afternoon, where it can take traffic 45 minutes to uh, to get out of that out of that area. Um, so that's that's what we can do in the short short to medium term. Um, Nick, was there anything else you wanted to to add at this stage? Yes, uh, just if I could. Uh, um... The, the Horton Heath development will produce quite a lot of developer contributions, one expects. Um, and the biggest problem for the road users coming out of Horton Heath, coming to the north, which will be a minority of the road users, because most of them will go south, but 
it will still cause a huge problem turning up Sandy Lane to go north. We need a roundabout at the bottom of Sandy Lane. That's the only way it can be cracked. The idea of another lane is, I mean, we're getting about three cars uh, uh, every time the light change can turn, three cars can turn right. Well, you know, it was going to take two or three hours at that rate for the traffic coming up Arlington Lane to get up Sandy Lane. It just won't happen. Can the uh, developers' contributions be used by the borough to fund a roundabout at that point? What I hope will happen, Nick, is that we'll, we'll, is that we will expand the study that's already just starting, which looks at the road junctions right the way through from Fair Oaks Square through to the centre of Eastleigh, uh, to pick up on, on all of those junctions and what can be done to improve uh, flow. Uh, Sandy Lane is obviously one of those, uh, and the lane itself next to it, uh, clearly linked to. Um, and yes, I would expect that to happen. Where the Horton Heath developer contributions go will be a partnership issue between the Borough Council and Hampshire County Council as the Highway Authority, but I would hope that we will be able to positively use uh, the one Horton Heath development uh, as a way of helping deal with some of the traffic issues for the wider community, uh, not just uh, for the residents of the new development at Horton Heath. It's worth noting uh, the work has now started. I'm sure uh, many people have seen it already. Work has started now uh, on the new road link that will go through from uh, Torbar Way, Bub Lane, up to um, Burnett's Lane so that the Charcroft Business Park traffic uh, can get to the motorway and the M27 without having to use the bottom section of Burnett's Lane and without being tempted to travel hopefully north up Burnett's Lane, which I know has been a big problem in the um, Horton Heath area in the past. Uh, work is progressing on that. Uh, I was out on site earlier in the week. David Airy was as well. He would be waxing lyrical about it if his IT hadn't failed this evening, I suspect, um, because it was great to talk to uh, the contractors, the local contractors, Mildred, we're supporting our local economy by awarding a local contract uh, with the project that's there, uh, which is due to complete next spring. That will provide three roundabouts, uh, one at Bub Lane, uh, one at Burnett's Lane with the road link in between them, uh, plus also the Allington Lane Junction uh, north of Fertree Lane, uh, that roundabout that will eventually be linked up when the development goes forward. As you say, Nick, we'll need to make sure that the other junctions that relate to that Horton Heath development are picked up properly uh, to help both the existing community and the new communities in those areas. So thank you for those questions. Now, Jim Tidridge has been waiting very patiently in the wings. Um, the, the light on you, Jim, is, is, is um, coming in and out depending on where you're sitting I could, you can Tell sit where about you it. I, oh gosh if I, if I sit really still it still seems to go in and out I'm afraid so I'm afraid you're going to have to put up with this rather weird kind of okay. lighting I was, effect just, I was I trying to that out. before I put you on put you on live as to which position would actually get the light coming through the window <laughs> right at your face as opposed to sitting in darkness but I think we're just going to have to take potluck on this I'm so anyway the so. floor is now your yours Jin on uh, the SGO and the local plan Thank you very much indeed. Um, I find myself in the unusual position of agree of uh, welcoming your statement earlier um, about there being no building um, to, to take place on the country countryside in a speculative way in the interim. Um, that very much will be welcomed. But before I start, I'd just like to make it very clear that I am also a Bishopstoke Parish Councillor, as is um, Amwin Stanley and Mike Thornton. I am not representing the Parish Council tonight. I do not have authorisation to speak on behalf of the Parish Council, and I don't believe either of those two Parish Councillors do either. Um, no, but the question I, I think they said they did either, so that's, all, that's fine too. So um, what I'd like to um, ask about is what I've actually asked about previously with, with the local plan, um, which is um, following the letter, the inspector's letter to delete the SGO north of Bishopstoke and Fair Oak. I asked previously whether or not East Borough Council would be asking Winchester City Council to include the stretches of the proposed access road connecting the SGO with the, three, with the B3335, the bit that comes into Winchester's patch, whether or not Winchester would be asked to include that as part of their local plan, which I believe is now in, in development or not. And I, I hope you'd be able to answer that for me. Yeah, I can. And um... It's very clearly the whole SGO chapter disappears just like that. It's gone. Uh, and therefore, everything that was everything related to that chapter uh, disappears with it. So the various links throughout the local plan uh, that talked about the growth option area uh, just get exercised uh, in such a way that you never knew they were there. Uh, and therefore, the request to Winchester goes alongside that because there is no need for Winchester to make a reservation in their local plan for something which isn't in our local plan. Uh, whether they choose to do that anyway is entirely up to them. Um, 
clearly, you know, every local planning authority has got to think about where things might go in 20, 30, 50 years time. Uh, we've had a reservation for the Chicken Lane Link Road in our local plans for the last 25, 30 years uh, in the hope that eventually it will happen. Um, and we protect it on that basis. How winds choose to react will be up to them. Uh, we can't give them any guidance on that. All we can say with absolute clarity and certainty is the growth option has been deleted from our local plan. It no longer exists and therefore what they choose to do about any transport issues uh, in their borough area outside ours is entirely in their hands. Anything else you wanted to say, Jim? Um, just really going back to the point you made earlier about um, speculative um, developments would not be accepted on the countryside. Um, just noting really that it's quite sad that Fairex already lost countryside at Pembers Hill due to a planning application that was um, accepted broadly because it was going to be part of the local plan. So it's sad that that's taken place um, and forms part of a local forms part of the local plan that's subsequently been deleted. Um, I just think it's a very sad situation for the people of Fair Oak, but I welcome your um, promise to the people of Bishopstoke and Fair Oak and also other parts of the borough that areas identified will not have, will not have their countryside built on in the interim. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jin, for that. That's all. That's all absolutely fine. We'll proceed on on that basis. Pembers was was not an application that the council welcomed. Um, uh, many of us spent quite a few hours trying to dissuade the developer putting the application in. Uh, clearly, we can't we can't stop developers putting planning applications in if they want to. Uh, the advice that we had legally at that time, regardless of the growth option, because we we always saw it as being part of the growth option, not a standalone development, uh, was that regardless of the of, of whether the growth option went forward or not, the ability of the local council, us at that point, to successfully resist that development on appeal. Uh, was very, very low and therefore wasn't something that we could manage to achieve and it was put forward and permitted on that basis. As we know subsequently, uh, the council then chose to intervene at the request of the developer who was failing, as happened, has happened so often with developers issues around the borough, uh, and we have taken forward the development ourselves to make sure that we do get a quality development and also, most importantly, we do get uh, an appropriate percentage of affordable housing on that site. In fact, we've gone further than that uh, and we have 40% affordable housing coming forward on that site now, which simply wouldn't have happened uh, without the council's intervention. And that's providing affordable housing that is much needed in the Fair Oak area. So although we didn't want the application, uh, we've tried to make the best of the position that we've that we've got to. So I'm now opening up to general discussion on the SGO related issues. I've got Rupert Curl to come in next and then Derek Pretty uh, following. Derek, I need you to turn your camera back on, but I'll ask Rupert to speak now. Thank you, Chair. Actually, there are just a couple of points, really. Um, again, notwithstanding what the inspector has put in her letter, and clearly, obviously, we have to be absolutely mindful of what she's put in about the SGO. Uh, my real concern is that she also acknowledges there potentially would be a shortfall in housing numbers towards the end of the plan, which clearly, in effect, is not really um, particularly great from our perspective, because that actually does lend itself to having speculative, speculative development uh, applications around the borough from um, developers who are clearly be keenly looking at our plan when it is adopted um, to be able to obviously want to maximise uh, their deliverability of houses and of course the issue being that you know potentially we could go to appeal and everything else. Um, so I am concerned about the fact that again you know not advocating SGO where we we particularly asked for it to go because obviously at the end of the day the inspector has said that there wasn't enough to, to for her to be able to support that option um, is that actually it doesn't really give the residents of Eastley, in my view, the surety about where development will go and where it absolutely won't go. Um, and given that she's also said uh, that we would have to potentially look at our our gaps uh, and potentially have to, you know, have minor um, revisions to those. Also, clearly, in effect, sort of slightly opens the window to developers to want to put ribbon development in in some of our more sensitive gaps. And we have got those, as you're very well aware, certainly in my area around Botley and certainly around Hedge End as well. Uh, where they would be very happy in effect to put uh, relatively small scale development. But of course, as we all know, that doesn't attract the sort of level of contributions for developers contributions that we would then particularly want to be able to improve the infrastructure, which clearly does need to be added to and enhanced and improved uh, to be able to, to deal with that extra pressure that comes from new houses, new homes, 
uh, at residence and, and, and vehicles and everything else. Um, my only other point, if I may, uh, was actually about the uh, Chicken or Lane Link Road. Just to add on to what I said before is that actually, as you know, we did our very best to keep the Botley Bypass actually running through as a clear, strong aspiration, uh, which was clearly a, a need for our particular area in the Botley, Botley and Hedge End area, given, as you quite rightly said, Chair, that a lot of traffic in effect that was going to be using that and using the A334 was actually, in fact, traffic that was outside of our borough boundary. Um, and therefore, the air quality issues were being keenly felt by the residents of Botley, as indeed they are being felt by the people of residents of um, Bishop Stoke and Fair Oak and Horton Heath. Um, and so therefore, again, that I think is, is another uh, reason why we absolutely must do our best to reference the Chicken or Lane Link Road and continue to do so uh, as a very strong policy aim that will deliver benefits for all of those residents, existing ones and obviously future ones uh, that come along. And my final point, if I may, Chair, I'm sorry, is the fact that given that um, the Chicken or Lane Link Road now, according to the inspector, is not supported in its current form without further significant work, even though a lot of work has been undertaken over a period of time by multi agencies, as we as we are all aware, is the fact that actually, albeit the County Council do have issues with finance, money has been coming, I believe, from government, maybe not huge amounts, um, to actually look at more sustainable um, uh, forms of transport like cycling, etc., where more space may indeed be put aside uh, in the medium, short, medium or long term period to be able to act actively encourage more people to take sustainable uh, um, forms of travel like cycling or walking, etc. So it's a possibility and it's a shame, as you say, the council area is unfortunately not with us uh, this evening, uh, that actually, you know, maybe we might be able to approach the county council and maybe exploit obviously the project that you've just discussed in effect to see whether we can maximise opportunities with regards to those sorts of encouraging people out of their cars uh, uh, more, uh, especially with the COVID-19 sort of thing that we've all experienced uh, and, and see whether we can actually have some benefits from, from working with the county to see if they have some money or government money, et cetera, or whatever developers contributions that we can put towards those sorts of projects. Thank you, Chair. Thank you much, Rupert. Now, you strayed a long way from the SGO there, which was the topic we were meant to be discussing, but uh, never mind. Um, that's all. It's all good stuff. Um, uh, you're absolutely right to make the point about the Botley Bypass, and it would, if it hadn't been for your continued doggedness and Cathy Fraser's continued doggedness uh, on the Botley Bypass, I don't think we'd be where we are today uh, with, with the first contract let for some of that work uh, and the commitment to deliver it. Uh, that's been achieved partly again through the grant aid that we've managed to procure from Homes England uh, to make that happen and that's that's really really important so all those issues are absolutely right um, we have to keep the pressure up on the chicken and link road we have to do what we can to, to protect our gaps too uh, and that's absolutely uh, right so we'll go to Derek Pretty next thank you chair um, I think Rupert's actually raised most of the points I was going to uh, I sit on the North White Lee Development Forum on behalf of uh, HEWEB and I, I regularly see the uh, statements made by Winchester City Council regarding traffic flows from that development going through Junction 9 um, and all the uh, congestion that one sees there on a regular basis. The tendency I think will be to pick up Botley Road, in through Botley and then either through Hedge End to Junction 7 and 8 or more likely just straight up through Fair Oak, um, Colton Common, Winchester. I think the link road that we are losing as a result of the SGO being deleted will have a serious effect on um, residents of uh, Bishop Stoke, Fair Oak, Hedge End, Botley um, for many years to come. And I think it would be prudent perhaps if the two councils, Winchester City and Eastley, could perhaps have a joint approach to the uh, came to council uh, to see if they could advocate any uh, improvements to junctions or road layouts to, to ease the flow. I think it's something that clearly is long term, but um, as an individual, I sometimes feel that the boroughs and districts merrily uh, propose developments uh, to suit their own needs rather than the needs of the area. Um, perhaps a little bit more um, joined up thinking might be beneficial, but um, I just really want to raise the point that it's not just Eastleigh and developments within Eastleigh, but 
severely uh, affected by Winchester and Fairham. So that's the only point I was making, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Derek. I think it's uh, absolutely right to say that uh, we do now have a, a good working relationship with um, Winchester. Uh, uh, Lucille Thompson and the administration there are doing a, a great job. Um, we will work with them on future projects. One of the ironies about the now deleted link road uh, from roughly Crowd Hill, roughly to Albrook, and then up to uh, the M3 was that although it stopped traffic issues getting worse, it is projected to stop traffic issues getting worse on the Bishopstoke Road corridor. The area that it was a positive benefit to in traffic terms was Twyford and Colton Common, uh, where traffic conditions would have been materially improved, particularly at the Twyford end, uh, as a result of that link road. So yes, we do need to work with Winchester. That's absolutely right. And we will uh, take that issue forward. So thank you for that. Now, I've got no one looking to speak on the SGO now by the look of it. Um, and I promised Margaret we'd bring her in after the others that had spoken because she said she had a range of issues uh, and we'll see what we may we may well even deal dealt with some of the issues that you're going to raise Margaret but uh, let's see where we get to and uh, uh, what you have to say uh, this evening. Right. Margaret Atkinson. Thank you Chair. Um, I'm sure you've dealt with some of them but as always there's the finance one which nobody seems to like talking about except me and clearly they're going to be significant costs in what we're having to do in terms of the inspector's letter and in particular the additional um, public uh, participation, public consultation. And so I wondered if we have yet costed what these are going to be to East Borough Council. I'm particularly concerned in view of the finances um, as a result of COVID. We've got a lot of issues arising there. So when will these costs actually be um, known and when will they be put into the medium term financial plan? That's one question. I've got a second, but maybe you want to deal with that first. Yep, very, very pleased to Margaret. I mean, the costs of the, the local plan process at this stage are relatively light because the amount of work we have to do is, is quite limited compared to that which we've already done. And clearly we need to do it and get it right. Uh, and we'll account for that in the proper way. Most of that will be in the current financial year, but a little bit may well be even in the next financial year. Um, there will be some additional costs that relate to uh, any additional hearings that the inspector wants to, to hold, and we can budget for those. In the round, I have to say, th these costs are not that significant uh, compared to the cost that we've already incurred, which were some pretty stonkingly expensive traffic studies and wide range of environmental studies across the borough. Uh, we're now down to the nuts and bolts, as it were, uh, and therefore those costs are not something which in the round I'm that concerned about. Clearly, I'd rather not have them, uh, and we will have costs that relate to the local plan review when we start on that in due course too, whether that's not in the current year or the next year. Um, given the wider issues that all local authorities are facing, I'm relatively relaxed about those. Um, the medium term financial plan, as best as we've got it at the moment, it's a moving feast, uh, takes account of local plan costs. Uh, when we get more detailed information based on actuals, then clearly report those in the usual way uh, through the uh, audit resources committee. Back to you. Right, thank you Chair. Um, the, the second point really is relating to regular updates for members because I note that the um, amendments to the local plan are going to come back to council in November and I'm hoping that there will be regular updates uh, enabling members to ask questions during this process so that we aren't just um, given one fait accompli, uh, a presentation in November. Perhaps you can come back on that one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, yes, we will do. I mean, in the same way that I gave the assurance to Hamble Parish Council uh, in the earlier part of the meeting about the contents uh, of the gap review and any changes that are of consequence following the inspector's proposed modifications, uh, we will do the same with our own members as those emerge. We will probably uh, do an internal local plan seminar. I imagine that will be on Teams uh, in the early autumn rather than in a in a dusty village hall somewhere or, or even the committee room at Easter House. Um, and that will give people the opportunity to get back involved. Um, it would be helpful, I think, if we did something uh, like that probably in the early part of September based on the best information we have available uh, at the time. Uh, it's a matter of change. I think that the degree, the contents of the changes to the local plan will for most residents and indeed most councillors be, not be that interesting. 
It's about re-justification on the Chicken Island Link Road. It's about re-justification on local gaps with maybe one or two modest changes along the way. Uh, and we've already got the deletion of the SGO. Most of the modifications are pretty technical and pretty straightforward and they're not going to excite people. But yes, of course, we'll make sure people are updated along the way and have the opportunity to put uh, real and valued contributions into that process as we go along. Now then, um, I have at the moment not got anyone else indicating that they want to speak on the local plan item that's in front of us. I see no hands waving. I see no one typing speak in our chat boxes that uh, give me a clue as producer and chair of the meeting what, 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 who wants to contribute when. So I think that takes us to the recommendations. The recommendations are on the council's website, but this is quite a significant uh, uh, significant uh, set of proposals in front of us. Uh, so I'm going to read out the recommendations that are here, uh, which are the council notes that the delegated authority that the council provided to the chief executive on the 18th of October 2018 to take or authorise such steps as may be necessary for the independent examination of a local plan to be completed continues to apply. Secondly, and this is one stonkingly long sentence that either a planner or a lawyer must have written, there aren't even any commas, uh, approves the sending of correspondence to the inspector indicating that the council is content to progress the examination on the basis of the main modifications outlined in the inspector's letter of the 1st of April 2020, Appendix 2, and further action points, Appendix 3, and or any other main modifications that may be necessary in response to and acknowledging the inspector's letter of 18th May 2020 regarding policy HA2, Hamburg Mercury Marina. This correspondence should also state the council's continuing policy position of no residential development on the site as set out in the submitted local plan and explain that the council would like to work with the inspector through the examination process to seek a plan which can be found sound by the inspector and equally adopted by the council. Deep breath. Recommendation three approves the ongoing work to prepare main modifications, additional modifications and any further evidence required to facilitate the examination and four notes that the main modifications will be considered by cabinet and approved by full council uh, for public consultation. Now we're going to try a new way of voting. Uh, this worked really well at Hampshire County Council, so I'm going to ask cabinet members if they would unmute their microphones and either say agreed or disagreed uh, when I say. So all those in favour of the recommendations? Agreed. 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 Any against? Any against? Silence. There we are. That's all in agreement. Thank you very much, colleagues, uh, for that. That covers the local plan item. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions from around the borough. I suspect that a fair number of people have already uh, dialed off to do other things. I know that one or two are desperately keen to find out what was happening with the football match. I think Saints were one nil down at half time. I'm sure Ian Corbyn can tell us what, what the position is now. No, he no. can't. I no. can't. I had to, I had to turn it off. Very good. All right. OK, we'll move on then. Um, we're going to take the COVID-19 COVID response paper uh, next. Um, we have done uh, a lot of work on this over the course of the last month. This is uh, obviously an ongoing set of issues. Um, the performance of the council and the public sector as a whole, I think, has been absolutely stonkingly good uh, throughout this. Um, and we are uh, doing the best we can in quite difficult circumstances still. Obviously, people are now moving into recovery um, uh, rather than being locked down. That brings with it all sorts of additional issues. Uh, those people who have been in Easley Town Centre over the course of the last week or so will have seen uh, the pedestrianisation uh, of, uh, of High Street and Market Street in Eastleigh and lots of signs scattered across um, local areas around the borough, local town and village centres, as well as in Eastleigh and up in Charles Ford. Uh, to advise people to be careful about distancing, whether it's two metres or one metre plus, um, and everything that's associated with that. And the response generally, I think, from our community has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, we've still got an amazing amount of effort going in from, from volunteers around the borough, which uh, again, I think is one of the great positive takeaways from what's been a really trying, difficult and impossible three months for, uh, for many residents, particularly those uh, who've had issues with, with loved ones, are either being ill or sadly uh, passing away as a result of the virus or other related issues and not always being able to see them uh, at that time too. Uh, we are now uh, well into uh, uh, thinking through the recovery phase. The council's been working 
on this over the course of the last couple of months, as well as dealing with the issues as they've arisen. And I'd like to again put on record my thanks to all the council staff who've been involved in this process. We are now at quite a difficult point of change. Uh, shops have reopened. Uh, we know that on the 4th of July, we'll see many restaurants and pubs reopen again. Even children's play areas uh, will be open. Uh, uh, we know that still, sadly, we can't reopen our swimming pools uh, or our theatres. Uh, but in many ways, for a lot of people, uh, life will be getting closer uh, to being back uh, to normal. Now, our policy and performance uh, panel has uh, looked at this paper too, uh, and it's made a recommendation to us that we consider how to engage residents that do not have digital access uh, with reference to the COVID-19 crisis in particular. I'm going to ask Tina Campbell uh, to come in a moment uh, to speak on this paper and also to particularly uh, comment on that item. Tina, I need you to turn your camera on to do that. That's terrific. Uh, and then we'll see where we go after that. Tina. Uh, thank you, Chair. This is an incredibly um, important issue. I, I think we've all probably been shocked at the government's uh, apparent failure to recognise that not all school children have uh, a computer or access to the internet at home. So I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to um, sort of uh, share how we've been engaging with our residents, particularly during the COVID crisis, um, because we have recognised um, and have planned for um, making sure that we engage with all our residents and not just those who um, do have digital access. And of course, um, because of the nature of the pandemic, our, the th main thrust of our contact with residents has unsurprisingly been through digital mediums. But we've supplemented this with a leaflet that was sent out via Royal Mail across the borough. Um, we've used targeted phone calls to reach the most vulnerable and those without um, local support. We obviously partnered and worked very collaboratively with One Community and our other local voluntary organisations so that we were using um, the networks that um, exist, making sure that we reach dementia friendly groups, the visually impaired, older people and ethnic minority groups particularly. Um, we provided an 0800 fr uh, free phone number for people um, who needed to access the homelessness service, you know, during the crisis. We've used community radio such as Lockdown FM in Chandler's Ford. And of course, we've worked very closely with our local parishes. And we've also used our digital platforms to support the community to do what it really does best. And that's provide care and support at the neighbourhood level. So we ran social media campaigns to encourage residents to help their neighbours, literally the people who live next door to them, so that we build that community resilience and that we have those connected neighbourhoods that are so important for our well-being. And, and whilst obviously um, this question sort of particularly focused on um, COVID-19, um, that approach is our general approach. So, you know, we've kept the borough news to make sure that we are able to reach all our um, residents, that when we do introduce new services, you know, we take them digital, that we always do provide an alternative so that people still can um, access it by phone if they absolutely have to. Um, so I hope, you know, you will agree that we do an awful lot to make sure that we reach each and every one of our residents because they all do matter to us, particularly at a time of crisis like this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you much, Tina. That's much appreciated. Agree with all those points. And um, you know, as you say, a lot of effort going in and you've covered a, covered a lot of those points that were raised by policy and performance uh, panel. I'm, I'm hoping when we get to the recommendation, we'll simply note um, PMP's uh, commentary, which is, which is helpful uh, and useful along the way too. Uh, Tina, you mentioned the uh, the Royal Mail uh, literature, and I know Rupert's going to declare an interest because he works on, uh, on this, but uh, I, we still haven't got a satisfactory response from Royal Mail as to why not all residents received uh, the literature that was sent out. Royal Mail insists that they uh, they actually uh, did. Uh, I've just had a message from Margaret Ackerman saying, say, what about a &R's comments? Um, I've only got PMPs in front of me, I think, Margaret. So I'm um, apologies about that. I'll bring you in in a moment if you if you want to want to raise that. Uh, just in just just a moment, if you can. Just not quite yet. Um, I was talking about Royal Mail. Um, we um, we know that Royal Mail insists that every home every home in the borough 
did receive uh, the literature that we produced. We know that's not the case. Uh, quite a number of councillors are absolutely confident they didn't, and there was almost no post arriving at that moment. Uh, we can say very confidently uh, that this delivery did not go everywhere. So I'm going to make a, I'm going to add on additional recommendation if colleagues are happy with that, uh, that we make further representations to Royal Mail uh, regarding the failure of the company to fully deliver the Borough Council's main printed communication to residents uh, during April. Um, and I've, I've noted Rupert's interest already, so I didn't need to say anything additional on that. Uh, I'll go to Margaret next, and then I've got uh, Tonya Craig to speak. But M Margaret, apologies, I haven't got anything in front of me from 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 uh, A and R, which I, I know you participate in uh, with gusto and enthusiasm. Well, we have we raised quite a lot of comments, and the interesting thing is that policy and performance report of COVID was the May report, and so it was very out of date. Whereas the ANR report was the June report, which of course is much more up to date. And we had quite a few comments that we raised. And I think Cabinet would really have been interested to hear those comments. And I wonder, therefore, if ANR can um, give you those comments separately and they can be attached to the minutes because it was quite clearly a different report that policy and performance were reporting on. I can't remember all the comments that we raised now. If you want to be, me to be really boring, Chair, I could go back and raise them all, but I, you probably don't want to do the time at Cabinet tonight. But I do think Cabinet should hear what ANR had to say on the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. I would never say you're boring. I wouldn't dare be so rude. Uh, what we'll do is we'll get the notes from that meeting. We'll recirculate them to, to all Cabinet members. Uh, I'm sorry they didn't come through to us. Um, normally, we, normally we've got this process of getting uh, referred items from A&R and PMP. Apologies to non-councillors uh, who are watching this who don't understand all these acronyms. Um, we normally get that to work. It hasn't on this occasion. Apologies for that. We'll get those circulated uh, and available to everyone and no doubt they can help inform the future debate because this is an ongoing process. It's not something which we just get switched off. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a daily activity. So I was going to go to That's Tonya awesome. Craig next, but Tonya, Tonya's camera is not, not on at the moment, so I can't pull it up on the screen. Um, can you hear me at all, Chair? I can hear you, but I got a picture of a can of drink. It's not alcoholic by the look of it. But. <laughs> no, it's not. I, d I don't know what's happening. My um, toolbar keeps freezing. Everybody keeps freezing. My screen keeps going green, so I have no idea what's actually happening at the moment. Well, um, people have to just listen to you and look at me because uh, oh, I put yeah. the can of drink up. It's not going to be terribly interesting. And that's what I've done <laughs> no, just it's to prove not. that it's that's not. what's there. Um, it was just I wanted to add with the COVID on the recovery side, we've seen a lot of scams um, around at the moment. Um, one that's come to light today is um, elderly people being telephoned um, and told that they need to have an air quality check done in their house and that they are contractors for the NHS. And they are just saying that they need to access today and that the homeowner has to let them in for half an hour. Oh, and by the way, all you'll need to do is make me a cup of tea. Um, they're obviously pouncing on our most vulnerable. So um, I'd just like to put somewhere on record just to remind people to please speak to your elderly relatives, your elderly neighbours, and just make them aware that they will be contacted by letter if anybody needs to get into them for any reason. Please do not take phone calls. If it is a if it's somebody you don't know, just put the phone down. You don't need to speak to them. And please, please do not let people into your property. Thank, Thank you, you very much for that, Tonya. That's really, really useful. Uh, there are so many scams out there at the moment. Uh, we've had several reports to us uh, at the council. Uh, we've run social media campaigns on some of this, but as you'd imagine, a lot of the people who are in danger of being scammed because they're elderly, they may be less IT savvy, less up to uh, following Facebook and Twitter and uh, watching out for, for these kind of bulletins that um, they are quite exposed. And that's that's clearly very damaging. Absolutely right. People should not pick up things from emails or through the door or people knocking their door uh, unless they absolutely know uh, what they're getting into. So thank you for raising that. Now then, uh, I'm going to go to Ian Corbyn next. Ian sent me a message that he's too hot to touch. Uh, a few moments ago. Um, but, so this is virtually and so welcome. Uh, that wasn't what I said, Chair, as you as you as you well know. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to um, I just wanted to say that with the with the government's confusing messages, um, as we come out of the lockdown and as things start to be um, 
to return to some element of whatever whatever the new normal dreadful phrase is 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 going to be people people are are rightly concerned and i just wondered if we could make a, a an assurance that all of the good work which the council has done and we've spoken about it over 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 some some weeks acknowledging the hard work and 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 tina mentioned earlier the the sorts of things which which we've been able to influence that that will continue we only have to look at what's going on today on the news in bournemouth where clearly there is there is no social distancing people people's using using common sense is 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 frankly going going out going out the window when you walk around hedge end you can see fantastic signs keep your distance keep that that sort of space is great but people are going to be coming back to to the borough and they and and they could they could well be affected and we just don't know what's around the corner so so a, a, an assurance perhaps that we're we're in this for the for the long run for for, for people i think would be would, would be quite welcome chair if that's possible thank you Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, and yes, we know that a lot of the issues here are going to go on for a very long time and we don't really know what the new normal is going to be. And whether it's people having to take extra precautions or whether it's some people not being able to live their life in the way they've, they've, they, they, they're they used to, uh, that is going to be how it is for a while. We we can only do what we can do as a local authority. We are, uh, we are reopening our front desk next week for those people, particularly useful for those people who um, still need to visit us for things. Um, we have managed to maintain our customer service centre being open throughout the entire period. Um, we were taking over 2000 calls a week at peak, which is shows the level of interaction that's necessary between the council and, and the community. And that's all that's all really important uh, too. Now I've got Derek Pretty wanting to speak next, so we'll go to Derek. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick update for business. Have you got me? OK, right. Thank you, Chair. Mine's just a quick update for business and uh, trade in Eastleigh. The discretionary grant that we have discussed at the last cabinet meeting and was uh, advertised widely, uh, that closed for applications uh, on the Royal uh, Diary on the 12th. Uh, we've had an awful lot of subscriptions. We're over uh, the amount of money we can actually find to lend. We're going through all the processes. Uh, reviewing the application, see if we can trim it down. I just really want to let the business community know that Eastleigh Borough Council is, is on their side. We're working with them as well as the uh, community in general to make sure that when we come out of the uh, COVID restrictions, that we're in a healthy place and we'll work, really try and revitalise the town centre. Thank you. Thanks so much, Derek. The, um, the town centre work has been really important and I know that uh, has been pretty well received uh, uh, generally by, by residents as being positive. The business grants, I know that we've put a lot of effort into and we've also put a lot of effort into try and make try where possible and making sure that uh, grants can fit the businesses when the grants weren't necessarily designed by government to fit that type of business. Uh, it has been a bit impossible at, at, at times because there was quite a lot of prescription in the early rounds of grants as to how we could apply them and lots of businesses that really needed help uh, we weren't able to give help uh, in the way that we would have liked fortunately the last round that came around that you've just referred to uh, there was a bit more flexibility about and we've been able to to use that what we really need now would be the government to say uh, dear local government we trust you to use your common sense uh, with the residual funds that are left from the early rounds that have it haven't been possible to allocate and use those for those businesses that haven't ticked government boxes along the way because i know that i still get inquiries from businesses that are really important to our community uh, that the government haven't let us help and i think that's uh, really really important we've been lobbying government to make it to have greater discretion in that area and paying grants uh, but at the moment uh, the computer says no Right now, I've got no one else looking to speak on this item uh, by the look of it. So the recommendation in front of us is we note the actions taken by the council in response to the pandemic, including the revised medium term financial plan that I referenced earlier when talking to Margaret and also make further representations to Royal Mail regarding the failure of the company to fully deliver the borough council's main printed communication to residents in April. Uh, I'm going to note that Rupert can't vote on that last bit. Um, um, but for everyone else, are other colleagues happy to agree those recommendations? Agreed. 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 Agreed.
Thank you. That voting pattern's working, isn't it? We'll, we'll keep that up. I think it's good stuff. Thank you, colleagues. Right, we will move on. Uh, item seven on our agenda is private sector housing enforcement policy. Uh, this is quite technical, um, but it's important stuff about how we make sure we manage our uh, enforcement policies to give people protection around the borough uh, in private sector housing. Uh, I'm going to ask Tina Campbell if she wants to say anything on this because most of this is is social policy uh, related, though it's quite cross cutting. Tina. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm really pleased to um, introduce and welcome this policy. It sets out very clearly how the council will fulfil its statutory duties under the Housing Act 2004 to keep housing conditions in the borough under review. I think it's fair to say that the past three months have made us all appreciate just how important having a safe and secure home is for our well-being. This policy clearly signals our intent to deal effectively with rogue landlords and to drive up standards in the private sector housing market by enabling the council to use the full range of powers available to it to tackle poor and unsuitable housing which disproportionately impacts the most vulnerable residents in our community. The policy supports two of our key objectives to tackle social deprivation and promote the health and well-being of our residents and demonstrates our commitment to making Eastleigh a great place to live and where all our residents have equal opportunity to flourish. I hope that this policy will give residents greater confidence about the quality and safety of private sector housing that they can expect within the borough. I particularly welcome the introduction of civil penalties as an alternative to prosecution, which is an extremely lengthy process. The matrix provides very clear and transparent guidance in how the level of fine will be determined, taking into account both the level of harm and culpability. And it's really positive that any monies received from penalty notices will be ring fenced by the council to be used for future enforcement and thus will be driving standards up even further. So I do hope that all my cabinet colleagues will feel that they're able to support this policy wholeheartedly. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Tina. Uh, that's really good. Um, I don't at the moment have anyone listed to speak on this item. Most of this is quite technical. Um, it's very important, but it is mostly quite technical about how we manage to uh, make sure our business works. I'm not going to read the recommendation out because it is mostly technical. Um, oh, Rupert wants to speak. Uh, Rupert, you'll need to turn your camera on if you want to do that. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a very quick point. It is a bit of a technical point. When I was reading through the paper, it said, and uh, clearly I understand what um, Councillor uh, <coughs> Uh, sorry, what? Sorry, I do apologise. What Tina said earlier. Sorry, I do apologise. Um, uh, the issue was is regard to the fact that um, if we go down the um, route of uh, fining someone or a landlord or whatever for whatever issue, it does so then say that we would then not be able to then take a line of prosecution, even if that um, <coughs> behaviour or whatever continued and potentially got worse. And I was just wondering whether or not that was a legislative issue or whether it was just a policy issue, given that actually, albeit that we might be able to apply for them to be banned as a landlord uh, um, on the la on the banned landlord register or whatever with government, etc., that clearly something might need to move from actually just a punitive fine into something more significant if indeed it, it moved categories um, uh, into a more serious issue where, you know, potential life or health and safety, etc., uh, was put significantly at risk, uh, given uh, potentially a landlord might might um, continue with that sort of bad behaviour. And it, in the policy, it just says that we wouldn't be able to shift between one or the other. And I was just wondering whether actually is that a legislative thing or whether actually it means that uh, we could do that if it was required. Thank you, Rupert. Well, I don't know the answers. That's I don't know whether Tina is able to, to help us on that one. I, I believe, Chair, that it is definitely a legislative thing that um, you it, you go down one route or, or the other. But I will definitely I will take guidance on that as well. And if it's any different to that, I will obviously update Cabinet accordingly. Thank you very much, uh, Tina, and thank you, Rupert, for that question. It's always nice to have curveball questions that you don't know about in advance. Thank you, Rupert. Um, right, so um, I can see no one else wishing to speak on that one. So I'm going to take a cent just just on that basis um, because say so most of this is quite technical. So I'll take take that as agreed, and we'll move on uh, to the next item, which is climate change 
and our environmental response. And we have a written contribution uh, coming in on this one uh, from George Baker uh, in Hegend. And George has got a long history of being active on um, biodiversity issues in the borough, uh, often as a volunteer, and we appreciate the effort that he's put in on that. Hopefully he's watching this watching this uh, broadcast. Um, but I'm now going to go to uh, Laura Johnson, who's going to read out uh, George's contribution. Laura. I support EBC's Climate and Environment Emergency Declaration, the Strategy and Action Plan, with one major exception. That is Action 5, the redrafting of the Biodiversity Action Plan. I believe the existing Biodiversity Action Plan dated 2012 to 2022 is an excellent document, is more than fit for purpose and that available resources should be directed to implementing this BAP rather than in the production of a revised document. The existing BAP has identified 10 priority diversity areas in brackets hotspots, 15 priority diversity links in brackets wildlife corridors, 18 borough priority habitats and 500 bor borough priority species, each of which require protection, enhancement and expansion. The supporting action plan for the BAP contains 20 high level actions covering protection, land management, data and information, education awareness, which are aimed at directing excuse me, conservation work towards the objectives of the BAP as and when opportunities and resources arise. The BAP calls for these actions to be reviewed and updated on an annual basis during the life of the plan, but resources have not been allocated to this and the checklist remains as created in 2014. The current BAP was drafted in 2013 and is based in part on the original BAP 2002 to 2012 drafted in 2000, which is also a final comprehensive document. Seen together, these two documents include sufficient research and actions available to address the declared environment emergency and halt the decline in biodiversity in the borough. The executive summary of the current BAP written in 2013 states that the original plan was not fully implemented due to insufficient resources being committed to restore and create habitat. The situation has not changed today. There is an urgent need for EBC to provide the leadership and on the ground resources to drive forward the existing actions covering the hotspots, wildlife corridors, protected habitat and species in our borough. Now that EBC has resources available, I believe that these must be allocated to the implementation of the actions in the existing BAP rather than in the production of another plan to replace an already workable document. This setup will produce on the ground actions in many locations in the borough, which will be of immediate benefit to the biodiversity as opposed to administrative effort in the production of another plan, which will tell us what we already know. That is, our biodiversity is in real trouble. Therefore, I propose Action 5 of the Climate and Emergency Action Plan update June 2020 be revised to, in conjunction with local landowners and community groups, take actions as required to fully implement the 20 actions on the BAP 2012-2022 Action Plan, specifically regarding the priority hotspots, wildlife corridors, protected habitat and protected species, revise, reissue and publish the Excel sheet on a six monthly basis. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That was um, quite complicated, but a good contribution from George. I'm going to ask Rupert Curl to, uh, to comment on George's contribution, plus also say anything he wants to on the paper as our climate change czar. Oh dear. Don't really... Thank you, Chair. I'm not sure I like the word czar, to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, actually, firstly, I'd like to actually thank Mr Baker very much indeed, actually, for his contribution. Uh, it's a very well thought out response, in effect, and it's really, really good to see that actually people around the borough are very keenly watching, in effect, what we're doing, what we're putting together with regards to the climate change and environment emergency motion and action log, obviously, that we have put together and uh, and, and a sort of uh, uh, our roadmap, if you like, of how we're going to be able to achieve this sort of uh, ambitious uh, target of achieving uh, uh, zero carbon by 2025. Um, I think he raises some very interesting points. Um, clearly, we do have a strategy in place, um, albeit that members probably will be aware that obviously I believe that we did need to have more focus in on that. Uh, the document itself has to be reviewed on a regular basis. It needs to be sharp, it needs to be focused and it needs to be relevant. Um, I agree with what he says about clearly wanting to implement the strategies that are already there, you know, the main themes and, and quite rightly we have been doing some of that work, but clearly more needs to be done and more needed to be done within that intervening period. But the Biodiversity Action Plan is a real keystone 
uh, element in effect to the environment part of the climate change uh, uh, strategy uh, that we have. And therefore it does need to make sure that it is more in line in effect with probably our local plan timetable um, and also the document needs to be mindful of uh, uh, recent changes with regards to uh, development applications uh, with regards to um, the government bringing forward its 25 year environment plan uh, where it's obviously introduced uh, biodiversity net gain um, which obviously is is key to obviously wanting to deliver uh, better biodiversity through the borough but also the national planning policy framework uh, and also the agricultural bill which obviously will have some impact in effect obviously on the biodiversity uh, action plan and we want to make sure as I say that it is sharp relevant and focused and that it will actually deliver the real gains that we want to see within our borough and surrounding uh, environment uh, for decades to come. So I think there will need to be a review. I don't think it's a total rewrite um, because I think again Mr Baker is absolutely right the main themes the strands if you like of what we want to achieve will remain exactly the same but also the fact we actually have as a response to this um, clear strategy that the council has taken. Uh, we've actually expanded our um, ecology uh, um, department in effect by a significant number. I think we have four now, uh, whereas indeed we only had one originally. Um, so therefore we do have the capacity uh, that we'll be able to deliver a lot of this work, but also we'll be able to deliver a review of our strategy and maintain that review, as he says in his own statement, needs to be reviewed on an annual basis. Um, clearly that isn't a rewrite, that is just making, re that is refreshing and just making sure that everything is on course. So I very much welcome everything he says um, and, and clearly would be very happy indeed to take on board the points and, and be able to refer those, uh, that statement obviously to the board um, so that we can fully take those uh, comments uh, and, and uh, actions, if you like, on board to make sure that obviously we clearly are reflecting, you know, something that he is clearly passionate about as well. Because at the end of the day, I think we're all agreed, which is why it was a unanimous um, uh, vote at the council, is that we do care about our environment, we do care about our wildlife, uh, and clearly residents and wildlife and the environment all needs to live together. Uh, and, and obviously that sometimes is quite difficult to, to, to achieve. Um, but we need to do our absolute best to make sure that we can do that for existing residents, uh, but also for future residents as well. So yes, I very much welcome that uh, uh, chair. Um, and obviously, yes, we will take that obviously back to the board and uh, and, and act accordingly. Um, but just to assure Mr Baker, obviously we do take obviously um, everything that he has said is very seriously um, and he has got some good points. Um, with regard to the um, actual plan, as you're probably very well aware, um, we were tasked um, to come back to Cabinet with a uh, with an up to date action plan, which had some more uh, information, shall we say there with some more refined information about what we will be able to achieve. There are some dates there, as you all have seen from the action log. Um, a huge amount of work has already gone in by um, officers from around the council um, uh, feeding into that process with clearly, as we've agreed, the strategy has, has, has sort of uh, changed our focus, shall we say, to a degree um, about the obviously the impacts that the council have uh, on the environment. Um, and, and therefore, the action log is, uh, a, a, as you know, is a live document, but is obviously um, showing some uh, clear moves towards being able to deliver some of those key items to be able to get to the 2025 um, uh, carbon neutrality, which we obviously all signed up to. Um, obviously, I'd like to thank the key officers on the board. Um, you know, there's Sarah King, obviously, Jason has done a huge amount of work and other officers as well have fed into this process. Um, and I think it's a really great starting point in effect. Well, I say starting, we've obviously done a huge amount of work up to this point. Shall we say it's a, a, a great bridge, shall we say, into the next phase, if you like, of, of looking after our environment uh, and our climate. Um, so there's a lot of work there. I hope you'll have all read it. I know it's a quite a lot of uh, information there for you to take in, but we've tried to obviously um, split that out into themes. Uh, and I know some people will be maybe more interested in some themes than others because it may touch their portfolios or their areas a, a bit closer. Um, but I think it's a really good strategy and action log. Um, it's been into policy and performance, as you've already known, and there are some recommendations there, uh, which we may come on to in a minute. Um, but obviously uh, want to see whether there's any debate or any questions, etc., about it. It has already been raised and I did notice this, but when it went to publish, I do apologise to members. Uh, there are some impacts, I'm afraid, in the log, which unfortunately were uh, inadvertently swapped around. Um, so unfortunately, a couple of the impacts have, have unfortunately jumped into the wrong boxes. So the, the, I know that um, uh, um, 
So I can't remember his name either now. Um, I think I'm far too hot. Um, yeah, so sorry, I do apologise. Um, uh, Paul, that's right, yes. Uh, he actually did raise the issue that there were, he noticed a couple had been jumped over. I did raise this with Jason. Obviously, we'll clearly make sure that those are um, updated to be more relevant to the to the right action. Um, but hopefully people will have, uh, have noted the uh, um, uh, the action log. As I say, it's a, it's a very key piece of work. There's a lot going on. Um, and obviously, uh, as projects get progressed, um, uh, obviously, we will then obviously bring them back to cabinets or the appropriate area for um, either support or, or whatever. So, um, so yes, a lot of work's been done, but a huge amount, obviously, more has got to be done. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Rupert. Um, detailed commentary. Uh, that's very helpful and useful. Uh, I'm taking the summary of that in terms of the recommendation, Rupert, as being to agree what's in front of us, but to note that this is effectively a live document that's that's continually changing and therefore has the ability to pick up uh, some of the specific points that have been raised by uh, by George Baker in his contribution. Uh, I'm going to go to Margaret Atkinson next, uh, hopefully if she turns the camera on in time. And yes, she has. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say as one of the members of the original working group for climate change, along with Jim Chittridge and Rupert Curl, I just want to say how delighted I am to see the development of the plan and fully support um, how it's progressing and welcome um, the, the comments that would be made tonight. So just to say yes, fully supportive of this and long may it continue to go forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Margaret, uh, I've not got anyone else wishing to speak at the moment. Um, we have got uh, some commentary from the policy performance panel, uh, as Rupert mentioned, uh, some of which I think we can agree to and some of which uh, not currently as drafted. Um, PMP asked for us to look at the airport specifically with total emissions and of the total emissions from the airport that the amount the borough is accountable for quantified. Uh, clearly, we already are doing a fair bit of work that relates to the airport. I'm, I'm always wary about singling out particular sect sectors uh, in this kind of recommendation because uh, we know that the airport is clearly a significant issue in terms of climate change. But it's also a significant issue in terms of our local economy, but then also the marine sector is as well. Um, and we need to think about uh, all of the, those uh, carbon uh, producers uh, and how we deal with them so far as emissions are concerned. So I'm, I'm going to suggest that we don't take that recommendation on board. Um, PMP rightly made the point that there are positive and useful links between the Climate Change Board and the Council's housing programme. Um, and we actually are already taking that into account. We perhaps need to make sure that as far as our climate change and environmental emergency action plan is concerned, there's reference to our work on housing and we can certainly take that into the next next iteration. And the panel also uh, looks, asked us to look at ways of increasing transparency, including publishing minutes of meetings. Well, the, the Climate Change Board is just an internal working group. It has no executive power. So this is the vehicle, Cabinet, of actually publishing uh, our processes. And we will obviously make sure that continues to happen because we as a body are about as transparent as it's possible uh, to be. Now, I've got no one else uh, indicating they want to speak on this item. Uh, so if colleagues are happy, the recommendation is that we approve the Climate and Environmental Emergency Action Plan and note the 2019-20 Greenhouse Gas Report and the positive steps taken over the previous 12 months. I think we're also noting that this is also an, an iterative process uh, that responds to the representations that are continually being made to us, and we can do that too. Are colleagues happy to accept those recommendations? I'm taking Agreed. dots. And great. Great. I'm taking nods and agreed as the as the way forward there. So thank you very much for that. Uh, move on to someone else jumped in there, I think. No, maybe not. No, OK, uh, we're moving on to the next item then, which is the members announces actual amounts paid 2019 to 20. And that's just for information. So I'm happy that colleagues can uh, just I think somebody's unmuted because I'm getting a really bad echo on your voice. Can we just check? Has anyone got it playing in the background? No? OK, apologies. There is a really bad echo there. No, that must have been someone unmuted for a while with a loudspeaker. I expect that it was playing back, but uh, it's gone now. So thank you, whoever muted themselves. That's good. Um, so we're moving to item nine, which is members allowances to note the actual amounts paid in 2019-20. Um, this is uh, just here for the record. It's about transparency, recording um, the allowances that go to all councillors across the 
across the council and they're here for 2019-20. Colleagues happy to, to agree we note those. I'm sure we are. Good. Um, so the next yeah. item is, to, is a, a formal motion to exclude the press and the public uh, from our meeting because we have uh, one confidential item to consider. Um, can I take a formal vote on that? I'll ask people to, to say if they agree or not. Colleagues agreed to exclude the press and public for one exempt item. Agreed. 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 Thank you very much. OK, so at that point, yeah. um, at five past eight, uh, we can move to uh, close this evening's full meeting. Uh, councillors who are due to continue with the next short item uh, are, are advised when this uh, meeting finally does conclude uh, to switch across from Microsoft Teams Live to Microsoft Teams. We'll join you there uh, in a few moments. Um, but in the meantime, for all those who are watching this uh, this evening, uh, thank you very much for taking part uh, and a good evening uh, as the temperature slowly begins just to drop a bit. Good night. <laughs>